afternoon and welcome everyone. This is the uh, Sally and Ralph Duchin campus lecture series in Judaic studies made possible by the generosity of the Duchin family. Uh, I'm David Graysboard and I'm privileged to form part of the Arizona Center for Judaic Studies here at the U of A, the University of Arizona. Today, I have the pleasure of welcoming Professor Miriam Udell, one of the foremost scholars of Yiddish literature. Uh, Dr. Udell is Associate Professor of German Studies and Jewish Studies at Emory University in Atlanta. Her academic research interests include 20th century Yiddish culture, Jewish children's literature, and American Jewish literature. She's the author of many works, including the book entitled Never Better, The Modern Jewish Picaresque. That particular title won the 2017 National Jewish Book Award in Modern Jewish Thought and Experience. Professor Udell has also edited an award-winning anthology of Yiddish stories for children entitled Honey on the Page. She's currently working on a critical study of Yiddish children's literature. More on that uh, particular aspect in a moment. Uh, in a couple of seconds, the professor and I will converse about who, her work. Uh, this will take us something in the order of 45 minutes, give or take. Then I will read and I will allow her to respond to your queries uh, uh, for about 15 minutes. Uh, and you may post those queries in the Q&A section of the Zoom room. The Q&A uh, icon, as distinct from the chat icon, is located on the lower right-hand side of your Zoom frame. Now, if we can't get to your question or your comment for whatever reason, please uh, don't worry because this event is only the first in what you might call a, a sumptuous two-course meal. Uh, what I mean is that Professor Udell will be uh, returning uh, via Zoom in the spring in February to deliver a full-fledged formal lecture on her research and findings. Details on that lecture will follow by snail mail and by, uh, by various online media. So be alert to that information. I conclude the introduction by thanking all of you for being here. Uh, of course, I also want to thank the Duchin family for its uh, sponsorship of this and many other of our talks. Uh, thanks finally to Martha Castleberry and especially to Jackie Schmidt. Uh, both of them have worked uh, very hard on this and other events for Judaic studies and without them, really without you, uh, the registrants, our viewers, uh, Judaic studies at the U of A would be merely a nice idea instead of a vibrant reality. So uh, Professor Udell, let me uh, give you the chance to say hello to everyone and then I'll pose my first question. Yes, thank you so much for inviting me to your campus, even virtually. It is a pleasure to be with you, David, and express my gratitude also to your administrative team uh, that was working behind the scenes and to everyone who's come out this afternoon to, to join us. Great. So with that, um, you know, give us a sense of the big picture, right? Tell us why you became a scholar of Yiddish literature and specifically what drew you to that subject of all possible subjects. Sure. So I really became a Yiddishist by accident. And what I mean by that is that I was um, I was studying, I was interested in studying comparative literature. And I thought that I would focus on the continental novel. And I was very interested in questions having to do with secularization, what kind of a role fiction played in the historical processes of secularization, but even more than that in a mostly secular Western world, how did the novel in particular, and really fiction, how did that come to be the sort of repository of moral reasoning? When we have to think through a moral question, an ethical dilemma, we tend to think about stories. If you think about the average American high school, um, they're probably isn't a religions course. There might be a comparative religions course that's hit or miss. There may not be a philosophy course, but there's going to be an English class. And in the English class, there will be some discussion of moral dilemmas. So I was really interested in those kinds of questions. And I went to have a conversation with Ruth Weiss, who was the 
professor of, of Yiddish at Harvard, and I had had very slight contact with her as an undergraduate, but never studied with her. And she said, you know, you're asking great questions, and Yiddish could give you a great way of exploring these questions, because the process of secularization took place so rapidly in Eastern, in the Eastern European Jewish sphere. If you just gained access to Yiddish, you could really undertake some meaningful investigations. So I did study Yiddish and I took to it very readily. And all through my graduate career, I maintained a kind of like dual identity where I was going back and forth between modern Jewish literature and the English and American novel tradition. And then when I had about a year left in writing my dissertation, Emory advertised this position in Yiddish, and I'm I'm embarrassed to even tell the story today because the the academic job market has become so competitive and so straightened that it is uh, vanishingly rare for anyone to get a, a position uh, when they still don't have their dissertation done. But that was my my good fortune in 2007, and it was defined as a position in Yiddish language, literature, and culture. And I said, I can do that. I can come and teach that. Um, and so then I was a Yiddishist and I sort of had to, um, I wouldn't say stop my oscillation between these two topics, because I think that my work on Yiddish is always very informed by a pretty deep immersion in the Anglo-American tradition as well. But I did really conclusively decide, okay, I'm going to work now primarily on, on Yiddish. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, very interesting. Uh, speaking of moral dilemmas in literature, uh, before the Shoah, the Yiddish novel and Yiddish culture as a whole really was in the mainstream, you could say, of, uh, of Jewish uh, culture and society it was very, very, uh, the culture was very broad, very vibrant. It's now mostly, I think it's fair to say it's mostly limited to academics and to uh, the lives of um, a small groups of ultra-Orthodox Jews, um, Ashkenazim, uh, in light of the fact that Yiddish is really no longer a lingua franca among a vast majority of Jews. Why do you think it's important, Davka, to learn Yiddish culture? Sure. So. Um... My colleague, Jeffrey Chandler at Rutgers has this wonderful term, the post vernacular, the post vernacular life of Yiddish, that it used to be a vernacular language for Jewry from Eastern Europe, which has to be one of the most um, mobile populations in the 20th century that, you know, that we can imagine. Then they took Yiddish with them wherever they went, whether it was to North America, South America, South Africa, Australia, Israel, um, you know, the Caribbean, and pretty much anywhere that you can think of. Mm -hmm. um, and it's such an important recent part of our past that we neglect it at our peril because the questions that were being worked through in Yiddish, questions about how to live in the modern world, how to transmit some kind of Jewish identity that would be authentically rooted in the past, but that would also come to some kind of meaningful accommodation with the circumstances of modernity how to figure that out for oneself and then how to transmit it to an, another generation and another generation beyond that. Those questions were being asked in a really vibrant way in Yiddish a hundred years ago. And so through the kind of contingent facts of 20th century history, through the vagaries of history, um, so much Yiddish has been lost, as you say, David, and it it would be a travesty of neglect if we didn't at least try to access some of the conversations that were taking place, some of the um, the strategies that were being considered 
through translation mm -hmm. for you know the broadest possible audience and for those who are so inclined through the study of Yiddish, which has also been subject to a lot of mystification. Um, one of the cultural critics whose work I really love, Rachel Kafferson, um, writes about how Yiddish has been mystified as if it's so such an extraordinary language that its jokes are funnier and its curses are more uh, more barbed or more pointed, and it's so hard to learn. And none of this is actually true. It does have these wonderful, you know, geschmack, delicious uh, forms of expression that become accessible in the original. But it's a language that you can study as you would Italian or Russian or German. And so it doesn't need to be this kind of lost and mystified heritage. It's something that our students can study in college that young adults, older adults, retirees can study and are studying now more than ever because so many of the wonderful language learning resources have moved online into the digital sphere. Um, so, you know, it's, it's really important to be able to access and it's also really accessible. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hmm. Now you've already underscored the the words uh, modern and secular a couple of times and I'm wondering how you define those terms and especially how you see those terms uh, expressed or embodied in the in the people that you study authors audiences and so forth sure so I think that the Jews are living in the world with everyone else and we are subject to a lot of the same phenomena a lot of the same social transformations thought transformations but as um steve zipperstein at stanford says and, and i just asked him about this last week did you write this down anywhere because i want to be able to cite it and he said no not really so i'm just saying that i i heard him talk about it in a symposium once he said a wonderful thing he said that it's not a question of Jewish culture being so different from everything else, but it's a question of how these transformations and phenomena get inflected. It's mm -hmm. the specifically Jewish inflection mm -hmm. of, you know, everything that's happening the world over. So when we talk about the arrival of modernity, the particular Jewish way that that gets inflected is by the Haskalah, by the Jewish Enlightenment movement, the Jewish movement toward romantic nationalism, as, as Olga Litvak describes it, mm -hmm. um, whereby the, the kind of drivers of high culture wanted to push the people, push the Jewish people toward a more rationalistic worldview. They wanted to revise all kinds of um, economic and social arrangements, what marriage looked like, what the economics of marriage looked like. It was very typical in the Jewish world to idealize full-time Torah study for men and economic activity for women, along with responsibility for the domestic sphere for child rearing and one of the big concerns of the Haskalah was to try to revise that and to turn men into breadwinners and to productivize them to get them involved in money earning labor um, making things growing crops um, engaged in artisanal trades as opposed to working as middlemen in the emerging market economies of Europe. So all of these preoccupations with rational thought, with transforming the economic and um, domestic conditions of Jews, and with supporting the, the kind of um, educational interventions that you needed in order to enter the professions or to uh, work successfully at productive jobs. Um, so, so I've just given you a kind of broad portrait of the Haskalah and its concerns, but that is what Jewish modernity looks like, um, at least to me. And 
when you say um, secular, I think that it's really important to underscore the unfinished asymptotic quality of the secular. You can always be secularizing, you can be going toward this kind of um, this secular end point, but it turns out to be a vanishing point. You never really get there because the secular is always defined in relation to this other thing that came earlier, the religious. And so it ends up being more of a dialectical relationship where one is talking to the other or, you know, has the other in mind. There's only if if you kind of center your identity on holding a ball and eating pork on the night of Yom Kippur, right? In other words, you're doing the most secular, transgressive thing you can imagine. The thing that makes that transgressive and that gives it that sort of like thrill or frisson or look, I'm doing something meaningful is that you are contravening a set of rules, right? So you are acknowledging it and I almost want to say honoring it, not really honoring it, but acknowledging it in the breach. So right. it's it's a religious heritage that even the most determined actors in the modern Jewish world and in the secular, you know, part of that world that they could never fully get away from or shake. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we see that reflected in Yiddish literature and certainly in Yiddish children's literature. Yeah. So the secular, it sounds from what you're saying, is, is a kind of constant redefinition of the traditional. In that sense, is it possible to say that traditionalist responses to whatever the modern world means are themselves secular, even if they, you know, they, they wave the flag of Torah and commandments and so forth? Well, I think that they're certainly just as modern mm -hmm. as, you know, a, a secular impulse yeah. um, that mm -hmm. absolutely, you know, to um, to sort of um, construct things or, or to um, accede to the idea that mm -hmm. your religion has an opinion about the use of a smartphone um you know that's right. that's an engagement with modernity that's every bit as modern as um you know somebody who's attending the the yom kippur ball right 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 okay um so maybe this question will will help us to sort to make some further inroads into the matter of secular modernity uh obviously you're well it's not obvious but i mentioned that your earlier uh work uh much of your current work focuses on Yiddish literature for children. Uh, why did you choose that particular focus? What, what do you hope that that focus will allow us to see or to understand about the culture that produced uh, the literature? Sure, so it started out in a very utilitarian way. When I came to Emory in 2007, I was teaching a full year, a year long cycle of Yiddish language courses. And I was always on the lookout for authentic materials for my students that they could read in the second semester when they had just learned the past tense and they didn't have that much grammar under their belt. So materials that would be relatively simple, not, not Sholem Aleichem and not uh, Yud Lamed Peretz or, or certainly not Mendele the, the book peddler with his very highfalutin, very Hebraic diction. Um, and so coming from the vantage point of a language instructor on one hand, who was also a mother on the other hand with two very young children at home at that point. Um, the, the kind of convergence of those two identities was for me to wonder, well, was there ever any literature written for children in Yiddish? And I realized after the fact when I, you know, yeah simple internet search showed me that there were hundreds of pieces. They were out there. They were even preserved digitally and 
the scans are on the website of the Yiddish Book Center for anybody to come along and and look at. Um, and other places as well. Florida Atlantic University has a wonderful collection. They Their scans are in color. So if you're in it for the art or just for the kind of the visual appearance of the page, you can do a little bit of Googling of the Florida Atlantic collection of Yiddish children's literature. There are a few other collections that are also digitally available. But um, I very quickly realized that it was there and that it was a sort of peculiar thing that in my own Yiddish education, unlike the education I had received in Spanish, in Hebrew, we had never read any children's literature. It had just kind of fallen out of many people's awareness, certainly not everyone's, because as I've gotten into this project, I've realized that many people who attended the Yiddish secular schools did grow up on a steady diet of Yiddish children's literature. Um, there are people for whom it has never fallen away, but that those are small numbers. Um, so that was the kind of utilitarian answer. And I started thinking about it, wanting to study it critically, and also realizing that we needed to have a set of primary texts out in the world that would be accessible to readers of English. And so that was the impetus to translate, translate, translate what became Honey on the Page, the anthology that was released last fall. Mm -hmm. And the sister project that I have always been working on, um, and now I'm kind of racing to, to actually get done, is the critical study. Mm -hmm. And so I've had a lot of time and opportunity to reflect in a, in a less utilitarian, more kind of idealistic way about why this is such an important corpus for us. Mm -hmm. And I think there are a few different answers that I could give, and I'm probably going to give some of them when I come back to campus in the spring. But mm -hmm. one that I will highlight for now, since you did mention the Shoah, the Horben, the, the Holocaust and its destruction, is that most Yiddish children's literature dates from the 1920s and 1930s, when the nobody could have imagined the Holocaust. Nobody could have imagined that that would be the last generation of Yiddish speaking children to have a somewhat intact, and everything is relative, but even a somewhat intact childhood. And so studying this material re really offers us a very detailed portrait of Jewish joy um, from this period when um, it was the most natural thing in the world to, to be hopeful and to want to hand children a very idealistic vision of what the future could look like. And that was really the task mm -hmm. of Yiddish children's literature, to try to portray according to whatever the writer's ideals were, and some of them were socialists, and some of them were Zionists, and some of them were, were communists, and some of them were just plain Yiddishists. But whatever their ideological commitments, they wanted to portray what a better world could look like and how children could help to mm. be part of forming that world. Mm -hmm. You know, you mentioned your, your, the, the study that you're working on now, but uh, what, you, what you've just uh, mentioned makes me sort of uh, hungry for, for an example. I'm wondering, I mean, not to take the thunder away from the, the talk that you'll give in February, but is there, do you have a little excerpt that you can give us that can, let's say, illustrate that, that uh, imaginary uh, uh, ideal of joy that you're talking about or, so, or, another, or another message? Sure, no, so I would love to, I would love to take us through a story and kind sure. of, I'll do a little bit of reading and a little bit of, of storytelling. Um, I'm going to be speaking about a subgenre when I come back um, of Sabbath tales that have to do with figures who observe the Sabbath in very compromised circumstances. Mm -hmm. So um, two of the tales that I'll be talking about when I come back are in the anthology, but there's another tale that 
has to do with the Sabbath and it's of a completely different nature. Um, and it's a great illustration of Jewish joy, despite a lot of challenge, despite a lot of grief and sorrow actually. And it's a pandemic story. And unlike most Yiddish literature, I think we can safely say, it is set in Morocco. So that's a, a kind of fun aspect of this story. So it's it's by a, a gem of a writer who I would love to see become a household name among the more Jewishly discerning households. Um, Tsina Rabinovich, Tsina Rabinowitz, um, she wrote a wonderful collection of holiday tales in the 1950s when the mandate of Yiddish children's literature really shifted from visualizing an ideal future world to trying to um, preserve and consolidate Jewish knowledge, making sure that the generation that had survived the Holocaust and the generation of kids who were growing up in the Americas, Yiddish speaking children um, in the Americas, and she published both in New York and also a lot in Latin America, um, that they would be familiar with the, the tropes, um, the customs involved in every holiday. And so in this wonderful holiday collection, she has a Sabbath tale called Die Stumme Prinzessin, the Mute Princess. And this story takes place in Casablanca. And it's very realistically told. So there is a first person speaker who is visiting a Jewish orphanage, the Jewish orphanage of Casablanca. And he is speaking to the matron in charge. And um, she points out one child who's just playing on the playground at the orphanage. And the narrator says, I've never actually seen such a beautiful child, but why do you call her princess? Is that her name? And so the matron says, come sit down with me in the shade and I'll tell you the story of how she got the name princess. One morning when we hadn't quite finished breakfast, the matron began to relate, one of the older boys came running into the dining room and told me that someone was waiting for me on the playground. When I came out of the dining room, I spotted an Arab. He stood there, bent over a sack that was lying on the ground. Who gave you permission to come into the children's yard with your wares? I asked the Arab angrily. Don't you know that all peddlers goods must go to the kitchen? Go there with your merchandise. This isn't the kind of merchandise you take to the black market, the Arab answered, smiling and loosening his sack. I spotted a child's face in the sack. Get out of here, I screamed at him. You're bringing me a dead child? She's not dead. She's alive, madam, and breathing. She's one of yours, a Jew. I swear by Allah. How do you know she's Jewish, I asked, wanting to catch him in a lie. So you can see that there's this kind of unvarnished portrayal of the the suspicious relationship between the Jews in Casablanca and the surrounding Arab community. How do you know she's Jewish? How do I know? I know that the attic where her parents were hiding with her is now empty. Her parents died from the epidemic and she ran to the well of the Mella, the Jewish quarter, so people would see her there and take pity on her. But how do you know that her parents died in the epidemic, I asked, still hoping to catch him out in a lie. Do you think, madam, that the epidemic kills only Arabs in the Mela? Answered the Arab, turning to go. The epidemic doesn't spare anybody in our dirty Mela. She snatches whomever she comes across. She swallows up all the hungry, the thirsty, the filthy, and the weak. She would have swallowed up this poor girl too, had I not taken her into my home and kept her there all night. So then the matron believes the, the Arab and pays him something for his trouble in bringing the girl and accepts the girl into the orphanage. She is mute, the Arab said, and pointing to the child in the sack, I can't raise a mute child, so I want to sell her to you at a low price. My heart trembled with pity. I paid the Arab a couple hundred francs and got rid of him. 
We quickly gave the poor child a bath and dressed her in a little white dress. She looked like a little angel, but she didn't speak a single word. Soon I called our doctor. Where did you find this princess? He broke into a grin as he looked at her. She's such a beautiful child, a true princess. In the meantime, let's call her princess. The idea seized me until we can find out her real name. She's forgotten her name, asked the doctor, listening to her breathing with his stethoscope. She's mute, doctor. She isn't mute. She hears every word. She turns her head in whichever direction she hears a sound. The fact that she isn't speaking, it's a sign that she's been very badly frightened. When she recovers, she'll find her tongue again. Be patient, pay attention to her. She will speak. And so then the story describes how the entire week passes and the children of the orphanage try to play with this new girl. They try to engage her. She ate and drank like all the other children. She played like all the other children, but she did it all by signs. Would she ever talk? My heart was full of pain and pity for the mute princess. And then it was Friday morning. On Fridays, we all prepare for Shabbos, bathing, shampooing, combing hair, decorating all the rooms with flowers. And it goes on to describe some of the other preparations in this institutional setting. That Friday night, something happened that disturbed our usual program. As soon as I had kindled the fifth Shabbos candle and covered my face with my hands, a hoarse cry broke the deep quiet of the dining room. Shabbos! Shabbos candles! The princess was so surprised by the three words that had escaped from her mouth that she burst into loud tears, ran up to me, and hid her sweet face in the folds of my dress. She's talking! Happy cries could be heard in the dining room. She's no longer mute. Our princess recognized the Shabbos candles. There was such joy in our dining room that we forgot to make Kiddush to sing our Shabbos songs. We all held hands and started a happy dance around our princess. And she kept marveling to herself and repeating, I can talk now. I'm not mute anymore. I can talk again. Good Shabbos, good Shabbos. And that's how the story ends. So the girl has really undergone a severe trauma, losing both of her parents. And that is marked on her body in the form of this transitory muteness. And nobody's really sure of her identity. You know, they have a story about her, but she's been unable to confirm it until that point. And then there is the moment when the symbolic action associated with the Sabbath and its communal observance really kind of extends a bridge to her over the trauma and allows her to speak again and to take her place in the community. So I think that there's there's so much in that story. And of course, it's so poignant for us in this time of, of epidemic. Yeah, my goodness. Uh, you know, I have uh, something like like a sketch of questions uh, that, I, that I thought about before uh, this talk. And now I I find this story so stimulating that my brain is a little uh, short circuited. I have so many things to say about this story, to, to ask you about this story. Um, let me start with this. You mentioned uh, in, a, in an email conversation that uh, you view uh, the development of Yiddish literature for children as somehow related to the rise of child psychology. Uh, it, it, do you think that this story bears the mark of, of, that, of that particular influence? Uh, you're right that it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's multivalent, right? I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm listening to you and I'm thinking, well, this sounds like the Zohar, right? Talk, talking about the, the, the bedraggled maiden who gets pulled from the dust and so forth. Yeah. Uh, and, and also, you know, sounds like, like social criticism uh, by a Yiddishist, by a socialist, by a nationalist about the state of the nation, you know, and so forth. But uh, anyway, uh, let's start with with the uh, with uh, child psychology. Uh, do you see there some sort of uh, uh, again the the mark of a of a new way of thinking about childhood, about trauma, et cetera? Absolutely. You know, before I even answer about child psychology, I just have to say. Every time I read this story, and particularly when I have, you know, a probing interlocutor to, to talk about it with, um, I see something new in it. And I think you're absolutely right with that imagery of the Zohar, imagery that goes back to Ezekiel that we say as part of the liturgy of the, the Passover Seder, you know, this image of um, 
of the woman or the girl naked and bare, um, this, this situation of extreme vulnerability, and that is absolutely present. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, as far as child psychology, one of the most interesting things about the development of this corpus of Yiddish children's literature in starting right in the years of World War I, but really becoming a, a mass phenomenon with a long reach in the 1920s, is that it is developing precisely at the time when the principles of child psychology are being articulated and being diffused both through the Western world and the Soviet Union, which are both very concerned about what they call child guidance. And what it means for a nation to have, uh, or to what it means for a nation to promulgate a good childhood for its citizens, and what are the deleterious consequences if that doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. So Yiddish literature is unfolding, you know, sort of in tandem with this discipline of child psychology. And so there's an awareness of it. And when we get to the Holocaust, there is um, there's a, an article in one of the pedagogical journals that talks about how children in the American Yiddish schools were kept fully apprised of everything that their grown-ups knew, everything that the adults knew about what was happening in Europe um, to European Jewry, that they were not protected in the way that children in a more traditionally religious Hebrew schools and Sunday schools were kept at a little bit of an arm's length mm -hmm. from the destruction of European Jewry. And in this article, the, the author says, we may have sinned thereby against child psychology in letting our kids have this level of awareness and knowledge, but we had to do it. We saw no choice. And that's so um, astonishing and poignant to me that there is this awareness of the dictates of child psychology for a kind of ideal circumstance and the acknowledgement that things are so dire that we can't live up to those ideals. We have to let the children in our midst know um, what is going on. And so, yes, I think that this story is being published in the 50s is the period when the community has been able to absorb some of the blow, some of the initial shock of finding out about the events of the Holocaust. Um, and it is very much a kind of um, microcosmic instance of, um, uh, or a microcosmic portrait of resilience and how you build resilience mm -hmm. and how the community has a role to play in building the resilience. Of the right, individual. right. Now that this story you read is, is, is has a certain fable-like quality that is, I think, very, uh, you know, very comforting in a way. Uh, so it, earlier you mentioned, and I mean, in the context of this last uh, response, you mentioned, for example, the, 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 the presence of the nation or a, a nation somewhere in the mental universe of these stories, uh, you also mentioned socialism and, uh, you know, the, the, the genre of workers' literature. Um, so maybe to put both in one question is, is too uh, unfair, but, you know, tell us how these ideologies is relatively well-developed ideologies of the 19th, 20th centuries play a role in the formulation of, of the literature? So there were a lot of questions about what Yiddish was. Um, it was. It wasn't called Yiddish in stable fashion until relatively recently. And Saul Zaret at Harvard is doing really fascinating work on just you know what we have called Yiddish and what significance that has. Um, it was known as Teich, which is uh, cognate with 
Deutsch with German. Um, it comes to mean translation. It was also referred to in the popular literature as jargon, jargon. And the founder of the Ivo Institute, the Institute for Yiddish Research, Max Weinreich, talked about how a language is a dialect with an army and a navy. And so in somewhat parallel fashion, a nation is a community of people, a collective, a collectivity, that's a better word. Mm -hmm. Does it have to have an army and a navy, right? This was one of the great questions that the Jewish presence in modern Europe really posed. Could you mm -hmm. be a nation without an army and a navy, mm -hmm. right? And so there's a Zionist answer to that which with which we are all familiar. There's also a Bundist answer to that, which is you can absolutely be a nation even without an army and a navy. You and you have one eye turned toward the brotherhood of all humanity, a brotherhood of all mankind in the parlance of the time, and one eye turned inward toward the particulars of the Jewish collectivity. And there's also a communist answer that says nation shmation, there shouldn't be nations, there should just be an international uh, solidarity of the working class, right? And all of those were present in Yiddish culture and really prominent in Yiddish culture and in Yiddish children's culture and publishing. Mm -hmm. um, so that is a lot of what I'm looking into. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm struck uh, by the modern quality of, the, of many of the illustrations I, I see in, in some of the work that you've anthologized, or that accompanies the work that you've anthologized. It's really, it's quite abstract. It, it doesn't suggest the kind of, you know, uh, Hasbro and Fisher Price notion of, of, of childhood uh, that we're so familiar with here. Um, uh, so to retract the lens a bit, to go back to the larger question of Yiddish, uh, I've noticed that among Ashkenazic Jews, Yiddish is a focus of nostalgia, uh, sometimes nostalgia for kind of imaginary shtetl or the old neighborhood. And in, in other words, uh, Yiddish stands for a bittersweet memories. What you study though, what we've just talked about, although doesn't seem to me to align with a particularly sentimental nostalgia driven uh, image of Ashkenazic culture. So do you think it's, it's advisable in some way that American Jews who hold that sentimental image reframe their relationship to, to Yiddish culture? If so, how can they do that? Uh, for example, as your uh, teacher has recently suggested, ought they read uh, uh, you know, uh, the original stories of Tevye the Milkman by Shalom Aleichem rather than rely upon the Broadway musical uh, Fiddler on the Roof? So my basic approach to that is yes and, meaning enjoy Fiddler on the Roof. Who among us does not love a good Fiddler sing-along, right? You launch into one of those songs and I will complete it with you happily. But if you only access Fiddler on the Roof, then you're not going to know chapter one, which is about how Tevye comes to be a dairyman. And you're not going to know that it is a very sharp, critique, I mean, with fangs of prevailing conditions of economic inequality in Jewish Eastern Europe and Eastern Europe, you know, altogether. If we can bring ourselves again through studying Yiddish or through accessing works in translation of which there are more and more and more and more because there are wonderful initiatives afoot through the Yiddish Book Center, through other organizations to promote really fresh uh, translation activity from Yiddish into English. Mm -hmm. If we can access these works, then we can get ourselves to a time when Yiddish does not have to be in the past and in the rearview mirror, but we can gain a perspective where Yiddish is current and Yiddish is the future. And that's what's so exciting, I think, about studying the children's literature, because these authors were entirely relating 
to Yiddish, not as a relic of the past, but as a gateway into a very exciting future. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and as a means of expressing everything, not just some uh, some insult or some some cute uh, uh, description, sort of colloquial description. Yeah. Uh, you know, maybe in the in the interest of public education, what we'll do when we uh, send a note to our uh, registrants is put together a, a list of resources. If you can recommend any, I'd be more than happy to to put them on that on that email. I'll, I'll try to to uh, assemble my own list. Um, so I, you know, you've mentioned this uh, already. This study that you're uh, that you're working on, uh, presumably as as a follow up to the uh, to the anthology. Um, and you also mentioned some of the questions that you're trying to, to answer through that. Um, I, I guess, I guess I, I'm curious why the questions that you're asking are significant in your view. And also, I guess it, in the, you know, here in the, in the so-called ivory tower, we always struggle with this, right? So what, what's the, what is the greater import for people who are not interested in getting to the high technical granular level of things? Yeah. Well, I think one of the most um, broadly relatable ideas to come out of this particular study is that whether we have children of our own, whether we have children in our lives, nieces, nephews, friends, children, um, or if we're educators, there is a concern about cultural transmission and what that looks like and how we can, on the one hand, create an authentic sense of connection to what has come before, and on the other hand, really teach the values that are most compelling to us especially when there's tension between the past or tradition and values that we hold dear. Mm -hmm. And we don't have to struggle with, we don't have to totally reinvent that wheel and struggle with that all alone in the 21st century. This is, this literature is really a record of that struggle and a model of some approaches for how we can think about cultural transmission. So that's, that's mm -hmm. one of the really significant takeaways. Mm, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And, and therefore, perhaps a contribution to all these anxious American Jewish conversations about continuity, about uh, resilience, about cultural, yeah. the cultural thinning of the generations and so okay. forth. Okay. No, very good. You know, I, uh, we have a couple of minutes before I open this up to, uh, to, uh, to people's questions and comments. I, I want to go back to that incredible story. Uh, as I mentioned of, of the young girl in, in Morocco, um, as I mentioned, it, it has a certain kind of never, neverland uh, fable like quality to it. At the same time, I'm really struck by the fact that it happens in Morocco. Uh, I mean, I usually when I teach, for example, the boon to my students, mm -hmm. Uh, I, I try to cause them to reflect on the fact that the Bund was defining the nation in very, very specific terms. Of course, in very popular terms as a Yiddish speaking entity and therefore missed, you know, all of North Africa, the Middle East, anything that might unite uh, Jews across the, uh, the world. Um, and, uh, and here's a story in Yiddish presumably by a person who, if, if not a Yiddishist, then certainly was interested in the, the, you know, the, the, the continuation of Yiddish culture, who was imagining a Jew in, in Morocco. Do you see that as, as, as something uh, an anomalous or significant? Or, I mean, what's, what's your read on that? So it is definitely unusual. Um, uh -huh. However, Sina Rabinovich in this collection of holiday tales really takes care to, um, to bring us along with her to out of the way Jewish communities and places. So there's also a story included in Honey on the Page that she wrote from the, the same collection that is set in Trinidad. Mm -hmm. um, and it's mm -hmm. a Yom Kippur story about a, a descendant of the Sephardic community that settled in the time of Christopher Columbus mm -hmm. in Trinidad, who has assimilated and joined the Catholic Church, who is actually the scion of a Catholic family, who 
when um, a, a small group of refugees uh, from Europe at, in the time of World War II come to the island and establish a very small congregation, he reconnects with his family's own Jewish past uh, mm -hmm. by just the proximity to yeah. them. Um, so she's really interested in taking us around the Jewish world. And there are communities that were quite large and vibrant that are not always on the radar of American Jewry. We tend to think about, you know, Ellis Island, uh, Castle Garden, the Lower East Side, and we're not necessarily thinking about the agricultural settlements in um, in Argentina, in um, you know, the, on the Pampas. So we have stories set in places like that in Yiddish um, yeah. that are really kind of demonstrating for us the the global nature of the Jewish, yeah. of yeah. even the Yiddish 20th yeah. century. Yeah, and uh, would you say that therefore this is a kind of meditation, conscious, semi-conscious, I don't know, about the, the new Yiddish diaspora? Is, if we're talking about a book from the 1950s or, or a series of stories from the 1950s, yeah? Yeah, I, I think that's a great way of, of framing it, um, just in terms of, um, Right, what it what it means to think in terms of a diaspora. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very good, very good. I I see some uh, that we have about two minutes. I see I see a couple of uh, of hands have been raised, so to speak, uh, um, electronically. So I think I'm gonna I'm gonna move to that uh, to that uh, segment of the of the talk. But uh, what can I say? A dank really for for your for your responses. I'm I'm. I'm beyond stimulated. I'm, as I said, my, my brain is a little bit uh, short circuiting with so many connections I'm trying to make. Yeah. Um, uh, okay, so let, let's see, this is a, um, uh, uh, a registrant who says, uh, I am somewhat surprised that Yiddish children's literature did not factor into Dr. Udell's Yiddish oriented education. Yeah. There have certainly been scholars such as the late Naomi Praver Kadar Mm -hmm. who focused on Yiddish children's literature and periodicals. The, the book is on my dining room table. I was citing from it today. I mean, I feel such a, I, I was so honored last year actually to deliver the Kadar Memorial Lecture at Columbia. I feel such a sense of kinship with this woman who I never had the, the merit and the good fortune to meet, but who is now kind of my, my intellectual sister in really deeply exploring Yiddish children's literature. She wrote about the American periodicals based in New York, and it was a spectacular dissertation from, I believe, 2010 that was published as a beautiful book in 2017. Um, it was just my own you know, fortune that I was starting to study Yiddish in the summer of 2001, and I don't think that that research was really uh, widely known yet at that time. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. Thank you. Uh, another observation regarding the story that you read, uh, the quote, the child had to be sold. This is another registrant, by the way. Uh, the child had to be sold in the plot. Wouldn't the setting, the scene in an Islamic country make more sense? Would, sorry. It, the yeah, in, in other words, if the child has to be sold according to the plot, then doesn't it make sense to set it in, to set the story in, in Morocco in an Islamic country because of the, the sale of the child? In other words, it's, 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 it's saying that this is a, this is a, a, that this particular aspect of the story is a nod in the direction of uh, verisimilitude. Well, I think part of what the story is um, representing very honestly is that level of mutual suspicion that existed, right, in Casablanca uh, between a presumably very small Jewish community that was trying to um, maintain institutions like a children's home or an orphanage and a much larger surrounding Arab population. And so the matron of the orphanage says that she wanted to catch him out in a lie. She would have actually been she would have derived some satisfaction if this man who came with a, ch a sack with a child in it had somehow been 
lying or not on the up and up, but he was. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> yeah. You know, there's, a, well, uh, of course, you know, there's a, there's a whole series of stories that uh, posit uh, secret Jews, you know, uh, the, 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 the outwardly professing, the, the obviously mm -hmm. Jewish character meets a certain stranger scratches the surface of the stranger and out comes a, a Yiddish and a Shome, you know? Fully fledged well, Jew. Right. Fully fledged Jew. So there's a little bit of that there. I, I detect some of it. And also the, in the story that you just told us about uh, Latin America or the Caribbean, if I yeah. remember correctly. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so what, one thing that I, I left out of my, uh, my notes had to do with uh, the USSR. Uh, we spoke already about the, the political quality of, of much of this uh, Yiddish uh, literature for children. Um, what did the Soviet uh, regime do to this literature? And, um, you know, uh, was this done primarily by the uh, integrants of the Yevsexia or by some other parties? Can you say anything about that? So first they nurtured and supported Yiddish children's literature as it had never been nurtured and supported before. Mm. And then they murdered its creators. Mm -hmm. um, it, there, in the twenties, there was one set of policies even under Stalin after 1924, um, the USSR was incredibly hospitable to, um, to Yiddish publishing in general, as long as it could present itself as proletarian. And so much of it did. I mean, Yiddish authors really got that memo and were able to abide by it in many cases, um, you know, in, in good conscience, they, they wanted to write proletarian stories. A wonderful exemplar, the most prolific Yiddish um, Soviet Yiddish author for children is Leib Kvitko, um, who wrote story after story, narrative poem after narrative poem. He had print runs around 3,000, 3,500 in Yiddish, got bigger and bigger, topped out at 10,000 in Yiddish. Then his good friend Kornei Shuchovsky sponsored him championed his work and arranged for it to be translated into Russian, where he started to have print runs of 10 million. Wow. That is not a typo. That is 10 million copies. And then he was killed as part of the Night of the Murdered Poets, August 12th, 1952. Um, I mean, it's just, uh, I don't, I can't go into that full history. That would be another whole talk and a really worthwhile one. But, um, you know, love, 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 and then murder. Yeah, my goodness. So it was Soviet sponsored literature, uh, explicitly anti traditional, anti religious. Uh, or was it more, let's say, transitional, sort of trying to accommodate the, the reading public? you know, real or imaginary 10 million people to a, a Soviet future? So the theory was probably actively anti-religious. Mm -hmm. The practice in the sense of what was actually represented on the page was mm -hmm. more a-religious. We just didn't see representations of religion. You know, it, it wasn't that it was demonized. It just wasn't, it was pretty much ignored. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah, and okay. and then I would say, just if we have time, not only do we have you know plots and illustrations and literary representations to think about, but we also have orthography. Um, Soviet Jews revised Yiddish orthography in wow. order to strip away the irrational elements that came from Hebrew, like final letters, mm -hmm. like letters that appear only in words that come from the Hebrew and Aramaic element mm -hmm. of Yiddish. Yeah. Those all got stripped away and so the spelling was different. So the wow. spelling was kind of, I don't wanna say anti-religious, but certainly, right. you know. Right, so so presumably the lexicon itself was, was changed, if not- Ah, that's another great point. Lexically, almost no Hebrew in a lot of these uh -huh. works by no Hebrew derived mm -hmm. Yiddish words in these works by Lib Kvitko. 
interesting. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Uh, you know, I could go on asking you questions forever, but we are unfortunately out of time. I want to thank you, offer you a, a dunk uh, very much to, uh, you know, on behalf of the, um, the Arizona Center for Judaic Studies and our, and our audiences. Uh, I look forward to seeing this, um, this particular conversation, uh, you know, edit this slightly and put on online so that other people who couldn't make it today can enjoy it. And definitely we look forward to having you again uh, in the spring and uh, really to, uh, to enjoy more of your, your insight and see where, where the research stands at that stage. So uh, thank you again very much. And thank you all for, uh, for registering, for staying with us. And um, we'll see you again uh, in short order. Meet Fargenig, and it was such a pleasure to be in conversation with you, David. Thank you. Thank you so much. Likewise. Okay. Good night, everyone. <laughs>